everyone this is ross and welcome to another episode of fruit talk this is the podcast style video that i do for you guys every wednesday night at nine o'clock eastern we talk all about fruits and vegetables how to grow it how to prepare it in the kitchen really the exotic stuff the things you probably have never heard of the really interesting varieties and why it is growing this stuff and and preparing it yourself is just so great in this episode of fruit talk we're going to be talking about garden myths and just the whole idea behind garden myths i hear i hear so many videos and and you know whether it's podcasts articles just information out there about many garden myths it's just a big topic that people love to talk about i really don't understand it because yeah there are some some myths out there right which is a a statement that's made that's just not true and it's believed throughout time you know that's that's how I would define a myth but as I'm reading a lot of them and just various different websites I've checked out different articles different videos you know you can't really make blanket statements at all about gardening um, I think it's very difficult or, or having an orchard, you know, whatever it is, just when, when growing things in general, when growing plants in general uh, and giving you those real basic tips uh, or truths, I, th I think it's just extremely difficult because there's so many different ways to do the same thing. And every single thing that you could mention uh, could be totally different depending on where you live, depending on your microclimate, depending on your location, depending on your soil. So I try to stay away even though I make them all the time, even in my daily life, regardless of what it is, whatever the topic is, I, I make these general blanket statements all the time. But in terms of gardening uh, and growing things, I should say, in terms of growing your own food, you really just can't make general statements like this. Um, so that's kind of why myths in my mind are so difficult to wrap my head around. And as someone who was new to gardening at one point and was new to growing my own food at one point, I listened to these myths and I read them and thought I understood them. But now I've been doing this now for so many years that I come back to it and I'm just shaking my head at the whole idea. It just, it's just fundamentally flawed for the reasons I've, I've stated. So I kind of want to go over some of these garden myths. And we're going to talk about the myths and tell you why this isn't necessarily a myth. Because a lot of these things can't be applied to everything. They can only be applied to certain situations. So let me explain that right now. Um, okay, so the first myth here is water new plants every day. And I guess the article here is saying um, that's false. So I would say that's probably false as well. Unless, of course, you lived in the desert and you lived in a place where your plant wasn't really growing very well and it was sort of dying. Um, and it desperately needed water, you know. If you got a new plant in the mail or from... The nursery and it really didn't look too good the next day uh you know i would consider watering it obviously that's not going to be something you do every day in the long run with a healthy plant um i think water in general either it's too much water or not enough water really is the most problematic thing for anyone growing anything you know if you look out in nature and in the forest no one waters the forest you know so it's um it's kind of a, a very um difficult thing i think to understand unless you just constantly kill a whole lot of plants uh and for me mimicking the forest is really going to create less work and to the point where in in my garden and in my orchard anything that is planted in the ground i do not water one little bit and um, even at planting time. So, you know, but that's my location. That's my soil. That's the amount of rain we get. 
uh, and the the techniques that I use to enable me to do such a thing. So, um, you know, again, that's just there's so many sides to this that you can't make. That I I don't know if this really is true or false, right? Myth two: peat moss acidifies the soil. Well, uh, I guess what they're saying is that peat moss acidifying the soil is false. Well, peat moss certainly is, uh, I believe, when you first start out, when it's dry, uh, it is acidic. Um, now, I believe if you water it, something happens to the peat moss where it... Maybe actually say it here in the article. Ah, oh, one second here, guys. I'm just reading through this. Yes. Yeah, so, the article doesn't mention this. I don't think at all. But uh, what I wanted to, and what I forgot, is that in the terms of blueberries, blueberries need an acidic soil. Uh, so for blueberries to need an acidic soil that's pretty, pretty damn acidic, um, for them to grow and to uptake nutrients, it's very difficult. And that's really the biggest problem with growing blueberries in many different places, that you constantly have to keep acidifying the soil. So what people do is that they they plant their blueberries in big trenches filled with peat moss and it is undoubtedly a good thing to do undoubtedly uh, here's the problem though peat moss is hydrophobic and peat moss needs uh, lots of water because it does it, it does hold a lot of water but if it ever gets dried up it's gonna repel any of that rainfall that um, is trying to soak into that soil so you're gonna have a problem where you may eventually have to water the peat moss now for me I don't have to water my peat moss when I first planted my blueberries I believe I certainly did because out of all the things that need water or have needed water because the peat moss was so dry when I had put the peat moss down and then planted the blueberries into that peat moss, the peat moss is just not going to get wet. It's just not. So you have to sit there with the hose and really make sure that peat moss is very moist. Otherwise, your blueberries are going to die very quickly. It's what probably the one situation in my whole yard in my in the history of planting different things that that is the one thing where you could very easily screw up now and that's only because the peat moss is dry to begin with and it's hydrophobic meaning it repels water it doesn't get wet very easy so by watering the peat moss depending on where you live that water could be acidic or it could be basic and then by adding in that water after you plant the blueberries, believe it or not, you could then have completely ruined the acidifying effect of the peat moss. So what a lot of people do is they actually add, with their water, they add in uh, an acidifier so that if they actually do have to water their blueberries, they're making sure that the water coming from their township is indeed acidic. And in most cases, I think it's actually slightly basic or definitely not acidic enough to maintain the perfect pH for blueberries. Now, here's the other weird thing. Now, if you had just put down your peat moss and let it rain, well, rain is a slightly acidic. So you're technically really not ruining the pH of, this, of the uh, peat moss by too much, but you need a lot of rain to actually soak up all that moisture and without a doubt, you're going to want to put on a lot of um, a lot of layers of mulch to maintain and preserve all that moisture. Because if you let that peat moss dry, I'm telling you, it is a big problem. So for me, I don't water my blueberries to this day, and I haven't had a single problem keeping them acidic. 
But I did have to, the first time I planted them, water them in and get that peat moss very wet. Um, in fact, it was very easy in many situations that I have lost blueberry plants. It took me a whole year to figure that out. So, um, again, this myth is also sort of wrong and sort of right. You know what I mean? Uh, there's many, <laughs> there's just many situations for this. You can't, you can't apply the same thing. Compost is the best mulch, and I guess they're saying this is wrong. Well, uh, in my mind, there is really no best mulch. I mean, I guess there is the optimal mulch, right? There's the best you could probably ever get for your particular situation, but again, that can be applied to a million different climates and a million different soil types. You know, something where there's a lot of rain, where maybe it's the rainforest, things break down very quickly. Probably your woody materials are gonna be your best mulch because your woody materials break down the slowest, right? So it really depends on where you live. Whereas somewhere where I live, where things don't break down very quickly, maybe something like leaves would actually be the best mulch to get that organic material the quickest. So what are we even talking about here, man? It's just, it just blows my mind that these myths are just, you know, they keep, <laughs> keep coming, guys. Wood chips deplete nitrogen. This is a common myth, but it does. Um, it does actually deplete nitrogen at a very small amount in the very beginning of the process, but at the end of the whole result, it brings it right back. And to be honest with you, it's so very little that it's really not worth even mentioning. I don't even know why this is a, uh, something that constantly is brought up. Um, I guess it's just some things that arborists tell their clients or something that's been said for hundreds of years or, or maybe not hundreds of years, but for decades that, you know, this is just not a good idea to use wood chips. But without a doubt, it is 100% a good idea to use wood chips in many, many situations. Uh, in general, you should be using mulch in almost every scenario. Um in terms of growing food. You know, you maybe not want to put down the mulch and direct seed into that or transplant into mulch, but you certainly want to have some form of mulch to help preserve water, whether that is indeed compost, layers and layers of compost, or it is some form of, you know, wood chips, straw, leaves, etc. You know, this one I don't even know what to even say it says always remove suckers you know I don't even is that really even a myth let's go to the next website here uh, here here's here's a great myth actually this is a pretty good myth if a plant is under stress it should be fed well um, if you want healthy plants uh, you certainly should feed them right I think you should feed everything to begin with you should do you know soil tests, you should really observe your landscape, observe the soil, see what was growing there before you planted into it, and observe what it is that's missing. Um, observe the weeds. You know, a lot of people say that when weeds show up, there's a sign of a particular uh, nutrient deficiency. You know, there's a lot of telltale signs that you could, of course, understand that there's going to be a deficiency before you even plant your particular plant. You know, um, so in my experience, you should just understand that and try to understand that before you even get in this situation. Now, if you're in this situation, I think it's a great idea to feed your plants, particularly if they're not growing very well, but you don't have to always feed them in terms of fertilizer or micronutrients. Uh, you could just put down materials that break down and form and turn into those nutrients, right? We don't have to be giving them fertilizer at every second. Um, now, what this article here is, is saying that stress is actually a good thing, and it's true. In certain plants, and I want to mention this about particularly figs and persimmons, uh, a less fertile soil is actually beneficial to getting fruit set. Um, not only is it beneficial to getting fruit set, but you may even have higher bricks. Uh, in terms of water anyway, when things are drought uh, stressed, 
They increase the sugars in the fruits uh, almost across the board. In almost all fruits, it seems like. Um, at least in temperate zones. So, you know, I would I would say that stress is a good thing, but at the same time, it depends on the type of stress, okay? You know, it's mentioning here compacted soil, heat, salt spray, you know, all kinds of different random things. And you know what? It really does depend on what kind of stress it is. If it's stress from heat or stress from a lack of water, I think that's mostly a good thing in most scenarios. Um, now, uh, or stress from even too much cold, I think can also be a good thing. These plants under stress will adapt and over time will, f will turn into stronger plants that you won't have to feed or care for nearly as often. But if it is a nutrient deficiency, I think it's really wise to actually give that plant the nutrient that they need, excluding water, of course. We're not talking about water in this scenario. Uh, here's another myth. Cover newly pruned areas with varnish, tar, or paint. And, um, well, there's a, there's a huge debate about this one, and it could go either way. Again, it really depends on your environment. Um, if you have lots of disease present in your area, and let's say you had cut out a lot of the disease, but you left some of that disease in the tree, this may not be a good thing to cover the wound. Um, now, or additionally, if the, the tree is disease free, but you are covering the wound, perhaps that will prevent any disease from getting into the plant. So it really depends on the situation. You can't say the same blanket statement for every single scenario. Um, okay, so let's see here. Myth, organic pesticides are less toxic than synthetic ones. Well, uh, most pesticides harm the environment regardless of what it is. So I think, um, you know, it obviously depends on the, the material. And you have to compare the materials, of course. But... You know, I would say probably in general, organic is always better than synthetic in terms of the environment, not necessarily for how it affects pests, as an example, but in terms of how it's created. It may be more sustainably uh, created. It may be something that actually is out there in nature that is a material like kaolin clay, as an example, which is an insecticide that is an organic material called surround that is much less harmful to probably the environment because of how it doesn't really affect the soil as probably a synthetic pesticide would but it does kill bees right uh, or maybe it doesn't kill bees but it does kill probably some pollinators and because it kills some pollinators you got to really be careful of when you actually are spraying any sort of pesticide or insecticide because if you spray it at the wrong time no matter what it's made of you're going to be hurting the environment you're going to be hate hurting the ecosystem of insects so again you know you can't really make these blanket statements you could say okay in general organic pesticides are better than synthetic but it's not true probably across the board because, you know, there's different materials and, of course, when it is you're applying these things. So th here's another myth. Newly planted trees need to be staked and wired, guy wired. I've never heard of the term guy wired before, but I guess that's what this is, where you have three stakes in the ground surrounding the tree with a wire attaching the tree to each stake. So um, I guess... In my personal opinion, uh, it depends on where the tree is located. Again, is the tree in a very windy environment? Is there a lot of erosion? Uh, is there a lot of water that is piling up in this particular area that could loosen the soil and really uproot these trees potentially? Um, is there a lot of wind, like I said, that is constantly knocking into the tree 
making it form into an uh, inadequate direction. So, you know, I in general, I would say staking is a really great idea. But if you have a tree that's really in a pretty calm environment with really nothing wrong going for it, you don't really need to stake it, you know. And staking also does... Uh, or I should say not staking also helps with strengthening the trunk of the tree because if the tree is blowing in any way um, that really helps the tree strengthen the base and expand its trunk so and that goes for all all plants in general the wind really is beneficial to helping plants not become too leggy uh, okay so there's a myth right there I don't even want to talk about that one Okay, add sand to loosen heavy clay soil. Is this a myth? Well, sand will certainly loosen heavy clay soil. Almost any material <laughs> that you have available will help loosen uh, compacted clay. You know, uh, clay is a really great material though to grow things in. I, I think I have it made personally. Um, I love the clay that I grow in and I think only really the surface of the clay personally should be impacted by any kind of additional material only to soften the top layer um, but also to add a material on top to um, if you were to seed into that or transplant into that I think it's a better material for things to grow in when they're young is a is a more well draining soil when things are a bit younger and it's more compacted and things hold more water it's certainly not beneficial to be growing them in heavy compacted clay so you know uh, sand does loosen heavy clay I guess that's the myth but you know you may or may not always want to do this and in general I would say um, clay is not always a bad thing okay let's see here's another myth right there Do we want to talk about that it says right here myth when tra uh, planting a tree or shrub dig the hole twice as wide and twice as deep as the root ball um, I haven't seen any real evidence of this and I know the website here is saying it's truth but uh, I have really heavy clay soils with lots of water lots of uh, you know mineral content in my soils I haven't found this to be true in one little bit everything that I have planted um, and just really slipped it into the ground just moving away some soil and slipping it in uh, even planting things above grade um, really not caring too much about the hole that I have created uh, in my mind has not impacted the performance of the tree and or shrub or plant in any way whatsoever um, so I personally think this could be a myth right or this could be yeah this could be a myth um, but I think there is probably some special circumstance that I'm not personally aware of uh, and that somebody in a different climate that I haven't really grown in or haven't heard of someone mentioned this you know maybe a friend as an example saying that this is a beneficial thing you know who am I to say that this is a bad idea or completely false so I understand the idea behind it and that creating a larger hole is that you can amend the soil uh, but I think this is just a general it's really just a general uh, you know thing you can kind of apply to help new people understand what to do because planting a tree improperly or a shrub or plant improperly is not very beneficial so I think doing it this way is gonna almost guarantee that you plant something successfully but you can also have some negatives to doing this as well uh, you know by making a, a hole so big 
it's going to make things maybe even trap the roots into that hole that you made. Um, by loosening up the soil where around the root ball is, the plant may be less likely to venture out into the harder compacted soil that you didn't actually um, dig up. So, you know, there's a lot of things that could be wrong with this. And in general, I think it's very wise to not disturb the soil as much as humanly possible. So for me, uh, in general, this is a this actually is a myth. Yeah, I, I don't know. If anyone has a situation in which they think that this myth is actually true, I'd love to hear about it. But for me, in my experience, I haven't thought this to be uh, true in any any form. Here's a myth. Drought tolerant plants don't need to be watered. Well, it depends on your climate, right? So if you live in a a desert climate, an arid climate, no matter how drought tolerant something may be, you probably will have to water it, um, especially at a younger age. As soon as they can get themselves some deep roots, um, there are some species of plants that you actually will not have to water. There are some native desert species that, like cactus as an example, uh, ironwoods, figs, mulberries, Persimmon, um, you know, there are a ton of drought tolerant fruit fruit trees out there that uh, probably may not have to be watered even in the most desert like climates if you mulch them well and make sure that they are getting enough water at a younger age. You also need to plant the tree at the right time. Um, Jeff Lawton at perma, you know, with the guy that runs permaculture, who heads up permaculture, he's gone to the Jordan River Valley and he's basically built a food forest in the desert, in one of the lowest places on Earth, where the the Dead Sea is, which I actually have visited myself, and I personally can't imagine somebody growing something in the uh, in the Dead Sea Valley. It just blows my mind um, that he's actually able to accomplish that so and he's using the most drought tolerant plants there are he's watering them but he's not watering them probably as much as you would think because he's creating his own mulch and using that mulch to really preserve the soil and I would say probably in time if he builds up the soil enough I think he would agree that he may not have to water those drought tolerant plants. So pretty interesting. These myths so far, I have to say. Here's another website here. We went over this one. Paint pruning cuts, organic pesticides are safe. We did that. Oh, men clay soil with sand. We did that too. Don't water the garden at midday. Uh, well, you know, I think that's obviously a great idea for preserving water is that at midday a lot of that water is going to evaporate, but with certain crops in certain situations you may have to. There may be no other way to uh, have your plants survive. Uh, you may be trying to keep lettuces as an example from getting bitter and you're growing lettuces in the climate you probably shouldn't. but you're growing it anyway because you want lettuce and you want to feed your family you know that's something you probably are going to have to do from keeping it to getting bitter is water the water the plants water really the leaves to cool things down uh, myth five plant trees in deep holes to give them stability we talked about that myth six fill the planting all with compost and fertilizers again that's really just a bad idea um, because the idea if you do that is that the roots will not go out into other um, into other locations look for and look for those um, organic materials or fertile or um, micronutrients in the soil surrounding it but uh, in my particular soil it's so fertile it has so much nutrients in it that I have in the past made this mistake and I planted a lot of my grapevines. Um, I dug a hole 
and planted them into potting soil, added in all kind of amendments, and they're doing just fine. I can't see the roots for myself, but I know for a fact that the roots are deep down in the earth. They've certainly gone past the hole that I had created for them. Um, so, you know, I would say in other climates, this is probably a bad idea or other soils, this is a bad idea. But for my climate, you can certainly do this. Um, not that it's a good idea, but even you could feed that hole as much as you wanted put in the whole thing filled with worm castings and inevitably uh, in my climate I truly believe that most of these plants if they can have a strong enough root system obviously go out into other areas of the soil and uh, and root themselves in those locations I'm not even sure what this word is Xeriscape Okay, myth number eight, plant two of each fruit tree. Well, this is a good, this is a good myth, I think, to talk about here. Uh, we also have feed a plant to revive it. Well, that's, I don't really think we should talk about that. And then the last one here is add sugar to baking soda to, to oh, add sugar, sugar or baking soda to get sweet tomatoes. Excuse me there, guys. Um... So we'll talk about those last two ones here, and then we're gonna we're gonna end this episode of fruit talk here. But planting two of each fruit tree is a, a pretty good idea, depending on the species. Uh, a lot of fruit trees are not self fertile, uh, at least in temperate zones. Your apples, your pears, your stone fruits, uh, a lot of those are not self fertile. Things in more subtropical regions are indeed self-fertile things like figs and um, lots of jujubes are um, you know even persimmons lots of persimmons are lots of pomegranate you know lots of pomegranates are but of course there are exceptions and i think in general it's just great to have maybe not two fruit trees but two varieties in a location so uh, i think it's great in terms of fruit set it's going to obviously increase increase your numbers, but you don't always need this. It depends on the variety, without a doubt. So some varieties will be self-fertile or will put out more fruit than another variety that wasn't pollinated either. So it really depends on the variety. It depends, again, just like any of these myths. Um, now, again, I just want to point out this one last thing here is that in my mind, it's better to not plant two fruit trees but instead to graft multiple varieties onto one fruit tree that's a very common thing that a lot of new growers including myself have fallen into that trap um, yes it is something that's harder to find it's harder to find scion wood to graft onto those uh, rootstock that you may have but grafting is a wonderful thing raising your own trees is a wonderful thing and in general it's just a lot less work to um, maintain one tree than 20 trees which is kind of exactly what I have in my backyard is two rows of apple trees uh, we have one row of 10 trees with two trees per hole and another row with the same exact spacing and two trees per hole and I could fit one apple in that exact space and have 20 varieties grafted onto it and be probably just as happy if not happier the last myth here, add sugar or baking soda to get sweet tomatoes. We talked about this uh, with the figs. Um, what was the other fruit that we mentioned? Maybe we didn't mention a fruit, but in general, water is the biggest reason why um, your tomatoes may not be sweet. So if you overwater your tomatoes, they're not going to be sweet. If you overwater lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, they're actually not going to have um, maybe even certain nutrients. They're probably going to be even more prone to pests, right? That's a lot, a big reason why inorganic fertilizers are so detrimental is that the inorganic fertilizers, they, uh, the, the chemical that is left over after the inorganic fertilizers are all said and done that chemical reaction that occurs, you're left with salt. 
And salt, as you know, because the Dead Sea Valley, you can't grow anything in the Dead Sea Valley because it's filled with salt, is that you're going to have the same problem with these inorganic fertilizers year after year degrading the quality of the soil because you've got all the salt in there and you're killing all the also you're killing a lot of the living things that are in the soil as well so what you then end up doing is that because there's so much salt the plant um, is affected by that right the roots get in contact with that salt and kind of dries out a little bit and as a result this plant may start wilting or may say okay it probably needs more water when in the reality is it doesn't need more water um, well it does need more water but it's a direct result of you using these inorganic fertilizers and then because they have sucked up so much water they then become more noticeable to predators and pests and this is just really not a good thing in general to do is to overwater any of your plants you know obviously for root rot purposes but again for that pest pressure and probably even disease pressure if I were to guess that if it if it worked the same way as it does with the pests so I don't think uh, sugar or baking soda is gonna do a damn thing it probably isn't it probably may actually hurt the soil um, it may bring in some weird animals into your yard but uh, yeah the biggest thing you can do here for tomatoes is not water them uh, just water them enough to keep them happy and healthy that's what I do to all of my fruit trees especially the figs um, one other thing I'll mention with the tomatoes is that if you really want sweeter tomatoes try drying them uh, string them up hang them and let them dry for a little bit and then use those tomatoes uh, to make sauce with the decrease in that water content you're gonna have a much thicker sauce less watery sauce and uh, a sweeter sauce so uh, and even a more intensely flavored sauce so I've learned that actually from a rest an Italian restaurant here in the city of Philadelphia called Monsu that's what they do in the Italian market and uh, we're certainly gonna be trying that this year but yeah, thank you guys so much for watching this episode of Fruit Talk. Shout out to Adam for um, wanting to make my podcast longer. So hopefully this one, uh, you guys can watch this or listen to this one in the, the drive to work. Uh, I think this one's long enough to uh, fulfill everyone's commute. All right, guys. Thank you so much for watching. Again, I'll see you next episode for Fruit Talk. Please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, if you enjoyed this video or this podcast, please give us a nice little thumbs up. You can also rate the podcast. I think officially very, very soon this podcast is indeed going to be on iTunes and all these other various podcasting hosting websites. So um, very excited for that. you know. And if you guys want to support me and the work that we're doing here with this podcast, Please go to patreon.com slash Ross Ratty and you guys can support my work directly. All right, everyone. Take care and I'll catch you all next week. Peace out.